When the massive bones of Megatherium, the giant ground sloth, were first discovered in South America in the 18th century, scientists mistakenly believed it was a fearsome predator. With its enormous elephant-like size and impressive claws, the creature was displayed as a symbol of an extinct carnivore. However, later scientific analysis revealed conflicting evidence. Ultimately, modern chemical tests confirmed the opposite Megatherium was a plant eater, a gentle giant that was simply misunderstood. When the bones of a massive creature appeared along the banks of the Lujan River in Argentina in 1787, they caused more confusion than clarity. The specimen later named Megatherium Americanum was shipped to Madrid, where Juan Bautista Bru prepared one of the very first mounted fossil skeletons ever put on display. Towering over visitors with pillar-like limbs and enormous hook-shaped claws, the reconstruction inspired awe and fear in equal measure. To the public, unaccustomed to fossil giants, its size alone suggested danger, and many naturalists of the time followed that line of thought. A beast this large had to be a hunter or so it seemed. That impression shaped early ideas, and for decades, Megatherium stood as a symbol of a vanished predator from another age. Yet for scientists studying the bones in detail, the evidence was never so straightforward. Georges Cuvier in the 1790s played a key role in analysing the skeleton and recognised that it belonged to a sloth lineage, though a giant one, unlike anything living. Certain features added to the puzzle a jaw and teeth more suited to grinding than cutting a skull that looked delicate compared to typical carnivores and proportions that suggested great strength but not the speed of a predator. The claws, however, seemed impossible to ignore. Their size naturally invited violent interpretations, leading some to imagine a scavenger using them to tear apart carcasses. Others pictured an ambush predator rearing up to strike. But these scenarios clashed with the anatomy of the skull and teeth. The contradiction kept debate alive for years, fueling one of the earliest disputes in paleontology, a field then still defining itself. That early predator image made for gripping exhibition and public fascination, but bones alone could not settle the animal's true lifestyle. Scholars needed further tests to explain how such a giant could survive without meat. Gradually, evidence began building wear patterns on the teeth, structural details of the jaws, and later chemical studies of ancient collagen that revealed its diet. Each new clue pushed the image of Megatherium away from the predator mold and closer to a very different reality. The question then became not whether it killed, but how an animal of such immense scale could thrive with a plant-based lifestyle, an answer written in its skull and teeth. Imagine standing before a skull nearly the size of a barrel, only to see that its teeth are not blades meant for tearing flesh, but broad, ever-growing cheek teeth built for endurance. Instead of sharp points, Megatherium carried rows of millstone-like molars fitted with interlocking crests and valleys, an efficient system for shredding and grinding fibrous vegetation. These teeth lacked enamel, yet their structure kept them self-sharpening, working more like paired shears than like knives. Morphology of the skull and jaw confirms it. This was an animal built for slow, steady crushing power rather than slicing and tearing. The most decisive evidence, however, comes not from shape but from chemistry. Chemical analysis of bone collagen, the ratios of carbon isotopes, showed a vegetation signal inconsistent with meat consumption, proving Megatherium was a strict herbivore. In simple terms, isotopes act as dietary fingerprints. Meat and plants leave very different chemical traces, and the fossil bones carried only the signatures of plants. In 2017, when a study published in Gondwana Research applied this method, the results ended the debate by showing the species relied entirely on plant matter. To further rule out ambiguity, the isotope chemistry was compared with hundreds of modern and fossil mammals, ensuring the readings were not an anomaly. This conclusion mattered, because the giant sloth's dental design had few exact parallels among living animals. Without direct chemical testing, paleontologists had long relied on guesswork. The isotopes spoke with clarity, and together with the anatomy, they left little room for a predator model. The jaw bones display clear surfaces for massive vertical muscle attachment, specialized for powerful up and down biting rather than sideways shearing. Such a bite would have been perfect for snapping branches and breaking down woody stems. Its feeding mechanics become clearer when you look at the details of the skull. Researchers note that Megatherium likely had a thick prehensile upper lip able to strip leaves and twigs, but its tongue limited by bone structure in the throat could not extend far. 
This correction replaces the outdated idea of a giraffe-like tongue. Instead, the lip and claws work together, hooking branches down, holding foliage steady, and feeding mouthful by mouthful. Combined with grinding molars, the system was highly effective for a slow grazer of dense vegetation. When it reared onto its hind legs, supported by its immense tail in a tripod stance, Megatherium could tower high enough to reach the crowns of trees. With claws strong enough to pull down branches and teeth optimized for reducing them to pulp, it was uniquely equipped for harvesting food beyond the reach of most herbivores. The diet it pursued would have included foliage, twigs and fruits accessed at multiple heights across the landscape. This explains both the adaptations of its jaws and the immense size of its frame survival through bulk and access to resources others could not exploit. Together, the isotope signals the specialized dental system and the functional anatomy build a consistent image Megatherium was not a hidden predator, but a giant browser shaping the forests it moved through with every branch it stripped away, and it did not remain confined to one region. Carried forward by opportunity, it has spread far beyond where those first bones were found, reshaping ecosystems as they went. For millions of years, South America stood apart as an island continent. Separated from the rest of the world, its wildlife evolved in relative isolation, producing lineages unlike anything else. Enormous predators such as saber-toothed marsupials and giant flightless birds evolved alongside towering herbivores that included armadillo-like glyptodonts and sloths that had long since abandoned the trees. This landscape created a distinct community of megafauna, all shaped by isolation and free from outside competition. That separation ended about three million years ago when the Isthmus of Panama rose and connected the two continents. This geological change triggered what scientists call the Great American Biotic Interchange, a massive exchange of species between North and South America. Northward came ground sloths, including Eremotherium, a close relative of Megatherium. Unlike their tree-dwelling cousins, these were enormous ground-based browsers browsing with claws and bulk instead of agility. Their size, comparable to small elephants, meant few predators could threaten them, and the new land corridor gave them opportunities to expand into environments sloths had never occupied before. Fossils of Eremotherium show how successful their expansion was. Bones and partial skeletons appear in sites across Central America and the southern United States, with evidence suggesting that some populations even reached higher latitudes in North America. This wide distribution proves they were not limited to sheltered pockets of forest, but thrived in open grasslands and mixed woodlands, adjusting to very different climate zones. As large browsers, these sloths functioned ecologically like giraffes or elephants do today, reshaping vegetation over broad ranges and leaving their mark on entire ecosystems. The direct traces of their movement come from trackways preserved in ancient soils. In Argentina, fossilized sloth footprints show enormous strides spaced like those of an elephant, giving a vivid picture of the deliberate heavy way they crossed the ground. In North America, sites containing multiple skeletons and bone deposits suggest that they did not wander as isolated individuals, but formed stable populations persisting for thousands of years across diverse habitats. The spread of these sloths cannot be explained by a few strays. Their fossils form corridors of evidence that mark a broader colonization. Their arrival also captured human imagination when their bones were first discovered. In 1797, Thomas Jefferson studied the remains of a giant sloth found in West Virginia, a species later named Megalonyx jeffersoni. His interest marked the start of vertebrate paleontology in North America. At a time when Americans were eager to establish the scientific importance of their own landscapes, the fact that their president could present a paper on a fossil sloth reflected how extraordinary these creatures appeared to the people encountering their bones for the first time. In life, these giants acted as silent engineers of their environments. Their sheer size allowed them to snap branches, topple shrubs and clear dense vegetation during their search for food. In both North and South America, the effect of their browsing would have cascaded across ecosystems influencing which plants dominated and which animals depended on those plants for survival. They were not predators, but their ecological role was no less powerful, intersecting with the ranges of mastodons, saber-toothed cats, and dire wolves in landscapes crowded with ice age giants. The story of their migration 
shows that Megatherium and its relatives were not ecological dead ends, but resilient and successful colonizers. They carried the evolutionary legacy of South America out into a much larger arena where they adapted, competed and thrived. Yet even with this adaptability, they faced pressures greater than size strength or range could overcome. The fossil record tells us they endured for millions of years, but the final chapters of their history would be written under very different circumstances. Ones involving a new presence on the continent that left marks carved not only into the land, but into the bones themselves. When the first clear signs of people appear in the fossil story of Megatherium, they come in the form of precise cuts etched into ancient bone. At Campo Laborde in the Pampas region of Argentina, archaeologists unearthed the remains of a single Megatherium Americanum dating to about 12,600 years ago. What made the find extraordinary was not the giant bones themselves, but the marks left upon them. Sharp streaks along tendons, muscle attachments and fat rich areas reveal deliberate butchery with stone tools. Scientists describe this site as a confirmed butchery event, the only secure evidence so far of humans not just encountering, but actively killing and processing a giant ground sloth. That event forces a question, how could small human groups have brought down such massive animals? The answer lies in strategy rather than brute strength. Archaeologists suggest that early hunters may have used coordinated group tactics, targeting weaker individuals or choosing the very young or very old when conditions favored the hunt. The sloth's huge size offered protection from most predators, but its slow pace and vulnerability on open ground made it within reach of determined and skilled hunters. Combined with wooden spears tipped with stone points, one fragment was even recovered at Campo Laborde. Early people had the means to exploit opportunities when they arose. Even so, one site does not imply continent-wide practice. Campo Laborde is rare precisely because the direct evidence of hunting is so scarce. Elsewhere, the story comes in fragments, bones with occasional cut marks in museum collections, suggesting meat removal or marrow extraction. At Santa Elena in Brazil, the evidence takes a different form. Here, archeologists uncovered osteoderms from ground sloths that had been drilled, polished, and shaped into pendants. This shows that human use of sloth material is attested not only by cuts on bone, but also by objects deliberately crafted for personal adornment, broadening our understanding of how people valued these animals. Where bone is concerned, the line between scavenging and hunting is always scrutinized, but the evidence at Campo Labord rules out chance scavenging. The systematic pattern of cuts across areas of maximum meat yield matches deliberate dismemberment. Paired with stone tools lying alongside the remains and fire traces on some sloth bones at Santa Elena, the conclusion becomes difficult to avoid. Humans were not passive witnesses. They were active participants in extracting resources from the largest animals they encountered. Still, the broader extinction debate requires restraint. While individual kill and butchery sites prove that hunting happened, the number of confirmed cases is small. Some scholars argue that human impact alone could not have erased the giant sloths without the added stress of rapid climate shifts at the end of the Ice Age. Vegetation zones changed, water sources moved, and ecosystems that once supported giants shrank. The extinction question remains debated. There are a few clear butchery and use sites, but whether hunting alone drove continent-wide disappearance is unresolved and likely multifactorial. For early humans, however, the advantages of exploiting such an animal were considerable. A single sloth could provide hundreds of kilograms of meat, a hide big enough for shelter or clothing bones, workable into tools and symbolic objects like pendants. It is easy to see why such opportunities were seized when available, yet the costs fell heavily on the slow-moving giants themselves. The ecological squeeze grew tighter when you combine resource competition, environmental change and deliberate hunting pressure at key sites. All of this raises an engaging question for us. Do you think a few well-placed human groups could trigger the extinction of such immense creatures or must climate have done most of the work? That very question continues to shape how scientists interpret the end of the Ice Age. What emerges from these discoveries is a recognition that humans were present at decisive moments in Megatherium's history. The giant ground sloth may have towered above them, but the evidence carved into its remains shows that people could turn the scale. From there, the story of Megatherium no longer begins with its power or its claws, but with its identity as a gentle herbivore confronting new pressures that no size could resist.
What began as a supposed predator turned out to be something more revealing, a giant browser whose claws and weight served for feeding rather than hunting. Its disappearance, however, likely came from a combination of rapid climate shifts at the end of the Pleistocene and the added pressure of human hunting. Notably, some Caribbean sloths survived for millennia longer where people arrived late, underscoring the human role in the timing of extinction. If sheer size could not preserve Megatherium, what does that suggest for today's largest mammals under stress? Which explanation do you find more convincing? Human's climate or both? Tell us why, and if you enjoyed the science, don't forget to like and subscribe.